Well, Julia, the group here already um, has a little bit about your bio, um, but tell us kind of the high points of your background. How did you get started um, doing the sport of luge and kind of what were some of the highlights of that competition for you? Yeah, so I got involved in the sport of luge when I was pretty young. Um, it was back in 1997, and I was just the type of kid that would try anything once um, and grew up skiing and playing sports and was always really active. And the U.S. Luge team um, came to Portland, Maine to host a tryout. And I didn't really know what it was, but the bottom part of the advertisement said I'd get a free t-shirt if I went out for the day. So being 11, um, free stuff is very enticing because it's your own, your own stuff, not stuff your parents have given you. Um, so I really just went for fun. Uh, a friend and I went, tried it for the day, and then that following winter I got asked to go to Lake Placid for like an official tryout in the winter time on ice. And again, being 11, um, thought, well, it's missed a week of school. I got to stay at the U.S. Olympic Training Center, and you know, when I was a kid, the Olympics were everything. So I said, let's let's go give it a try and went there and took one run and really just fell in love with the sport. And I just knew that that was it for me. Um, and it just sort of took off from there. From that tryout, I made the U.S. development team, did really well as a junior competitor. And then when I was 17, made the World Cup team and spent 13 years competing on the World Cup level. So it was just sort of serendipitous, you know, never pass an opportunity that comes your way to try something new because you don't know where it'll lead. Um, and for me, it led to the Olympics. What a cool kind of happy coincidence there. Um, but I know your path to getting there was not always easy. Namely, you know, you underwent knee surgery, you underwent brain surgery. Kind of what happened for you to find out um, about your need for those surgeries and what kind of challenges did they create for you? Yeah, you know, it's, I would say as an, uh, when you're an elite athlete, um, you're not doing it because you think it's, it's not for your health and fitness all the time. You're pushing limits. You're trying to be the best in the world. And with that, you know, come injuries, come setbacks. Um, but, so you kind of expect it to happen at some point, which helps, right? And then for me, it was always about focusing on getting a little bit better the next day. I knew what I wanted to get back to. I knew that I wanted to get back to competing. But if I didn't take the time in rehab, if I didn't focus on my recovery the way I focused on my training, you know, the option of getting back into, into competing might not be, be there. So it was really just sort of boiling down what, what sort of setback is this for myself? What do I need to do to get back to the to the shape, physical shape I was in to compete at that level? And then making a plan on how I got there. And then and then the other thing too is, um, you know, access to medical care. I had really good access to doctors and trainers and, and people to help build that plan with me. Um, so so the combination of support, knowing where I wanted to end up, and and being willing to do the work every day to get a little bit better to get back there is really what drove me. I love that thought that you mentioned about doing a little bit every day um, to get a little bit better. I think that's something we can really all learn from. And, you know, this was a really challenging part of your life. And what kind of kept you motivated to push through when maybe you didn't feel so optimistic? Yeah, you know, I'm going to be really honest. Like, support systems are very important. This idea that people overcome obstacles alone is is not usually true. And I relied on my support system. I relied on therapy throughout my career um, to, to sort of help me navigate the emotional stress of what was happening. And so never be afraid to ask for help and, and set up a good support system. Um, I think sometimes there's like this misconception that we're supposed to like carry more and more stress, which can pay off sometimes in the short term in your career or what you're striving for, but it's really bad for yourself, right? To set this higher higher bar for yourself on what you're gonna manage alone in, in stressful situations. So I think just if you find yourself in a challenging situation, like it's okay to not shoulder the stress yourself and like to ask for help and to, to rely on your support system to help get you through those challenging times. 
I think that's really great advice. I think really we can all kind of learn from that on this call because no matter how big or how small your challenges are, there's a lot of things that you you can't do alone. Yep. Um, and, and so you overcame these challenges. It sounds like you had such a positive mindset, such a great support system, and you went on to find some really great success um, in your athletic career and in your, in your personal life. And what do you think has been the biggest factor in you achieving those goals that you set out for? I think um, I, one of the biggest factors is being prepared before opportunities present themselves. Um, and, and you can sort of target what though you think those opportunities are going to be. Um, you know, whether it's a promotion at work, whether it's transitioning to a new career, whether it's an athletic, you know, goal that you're, you're striving towards. And you can start to prepare for it before it even becomes a reality for yourself. And so, so that's definitely one thing, being prepared before, the before I could see the opportunities front and center for myself. Um, and then I think the other thing is, is not, not limiting yourself by what is already happening in your career, or already happening in, in the mm -hmm. sport. It, it's, you know, you can be the best or you can be your best self. And when you think about being the best, that can be limiting sometimes. So really focusing on what's important to you, what does the best version look like for you, um, can create that sort of tangible incremental Wow, I love that. I just think that is so powerful to really make that distinction um, and, and a lot to think about. And you did, you know, you made some changes once you were done um, competing. I know you've done some nonprofit work. Um, what has that journey been like for you moving on from being an Olympic athlete? Oh, it's funny because I think we're all always in transition, right? And so it's hard to, to boil everything down to where I was as an athlete to where I am now because I, I try to feel like I'm on a continual journey. Um, definitely in worse shape now than I was. <laughs> so there's that, uh, my physical shape. But I mean, it's hard. I, I, I fell in love with the sport at age 12 and then I was really good at it, right? And when you love what you're doing and you're good at it, I mean, letting go of that is really hard. Um, and, and, and the unknown if you'll ever experience something to that level again of loving it so much and being good at it. But I always, you know, especially towards the latter part of my career, really spent some time identifying who else am I? Who am I outside of sport? Um, you know, sport was what I did at the time, but doing that work to figure out who I was and, and what else mattered to me helped with that transition. Um, and, you know, as I transitioned on, I think it could have been easy to, to get caught up in the what ifs and, and the things I didn't achieve. And I really tried to focus on what it gave me and not just athletically and not just the success I had, um, sliding or in competitions, but, but the friendships and the connections and the ability to, 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 to compete against the best in the world. I, I just tried to focus on what I gained from that and what I was carrying forward from it versus what I was leaving on the table, maybe. I think that's a great way to look at it. Um, you know, you got so much out of this and to really be able to bring that forward. Um, but I don't, I it's hard. Transitioning is hard. <laughs> and I'm sure I know, people have gone through it in other ways and I don't want to over, you know, it's hard. It's hard to leave something behind that you care about so much. Yeah. And was that one of the hardest decisions that you've ever had to make? Um, it was, I, I think choosing to retire. So I retired what we would consider mid cycle. Um, the Olympic and Paralympic movement is very repetitive. It's a four year cycle, you know, the games come around every four years. So the, usually people will retire after a games. Um, but I retired in 2016. So right in between the 2014 games and the 2018 games and you know, I really wanted to do another run and my body just had had enough. And I, and I knew that. I knew that my body was struggling to keep up. You know, I started to really have some lingering effects um, neurologically and, and thinking about the life I wanted for myself. I knew that, you know, it's probably time to walk away. And I also, you know, fortunately 
had space to make that decision, which not all athletes get. Sometimes it's, it's forced upon you, but I had a couple months here at home in Maine to really think about it, you know, think about what I would be, you know, what would it mean to go another year and a half? What are, what were the sort of potential risks of that? And, and it boiled down to really two things. One, in a sport like luge, you can't be sitting on the handles being like, oh, what happens if I crash? You know, is this gonna hurt my body? Is my neck gonna get worse? And um, I just lost my thought, but there was something else. But anyways, it was hard. It, um, my heart was still in it, but my body wasn't. And I knew that, and I knew the life I wanted. Um, oh, I say the second part was I was able, because I had space to make that decision, really think through, you know, say you make another games, how does that change your life? And I got to a point where I feel really good about who I am. I feel good about my career. I feel good about my life. And, and one more, one more games is not going to change that experience for me. So that helped a little bit. That's great. And you have such a, a positive mindset and it sounds like, you know, you've really been focused on kind of who you want to be as a person and, and how you're going to get there. Kind of what has that process, that thought process been like? Do you have habits or daily rituals that you feel like impact your mindset and kind of help you set yourself up for success? Um, I, I think so. I think for me, a couple things, I, particularly now in my role and, and what I'm working with other athletes, um, humility is really important to me. I think acknowledging that you could be wrong, that there could be information you don't have, um, and so to always be open to the idea that, that there's another way for a solution. Um, I also think teamwork super important that, you know, all voices are valuable. Um, all ideas are valuable. And the more you can bring diverse thought to the table, you'll end up in a big place, uh, a better place. Um, and then as far as like habits or things of that, walking is really important to me. <laughs> Um, it's funny, it's quite the opposite of the extreme workouts that I used to do, but I love um, to give myself sort of space to walk, to be centered. Um, you know, I, I think some would consider it meditation. Meditation can be, you know, so many different forms, but really making time for myself to sort of continually check in, reflect on my week, my day, things like that. So, that, so that's sort of that growth mindset. That's awesome. And I, I can see based on our attendees, I know a few people on this call who are big fans of getting outdoors and doing some meditation. So I'm sure they're very excited that that's been helpful for you. Yeah. And, you know, you have done so many in incredible things. And I think from an early age, people could definitely say that you've been very successful. But kind of how did you define success for yourself? Yeah, I... I think success has been an evolution for me. Early on, it was definitely trophies, medals, results. You know, what's the timesheet say? Am I fastest? You know, how, how much faster do I need to be? And that was all that mattered to me, you know, early on in my career. But, but now, looking back, you know, having retired for coming up on five years ago, you know, the moments I remember are not the, the moments that I felt alive. And sometimes that was a moment with my teammates. Sometimes that was a, you know, the perfect training run, which happens, you know, so rare, rarely. Um, and, and so now for me, success is really sort of like seeking the truth for myself, making sure that I'm aligned with my values, making sure that as I you know, work in my career, that I'm developing my character along with my career, um, making sure that my goals are grounded in my values and my personal beliefs. Um, and I think part of that is just watching um, the landscape of women's sport evolve, right? Like we've seen firsthand from the U.S. women's soccer team, from the WNBA, like the time is now to stand up, articulate what you believe in, why you want it, and really own it um, and, and don't be afraid to be who you are, share your values and, and hold sort of true to them. And, and that's sort of what I see as success now is trying to show up with my values every day, whether it's in work or what I'm doing. And that's how I see success. That's so powerful. I really think a lot of us um, can relate to that. 
And I know this is going to be a hard question because it sounds like you've really gotten so much out of every season of your life. But if you could go back and you could do some things differently, what do you think you would change? Um, I think if I could go back, I would have asked more questions earlier. Um, because luge is a sport that is, you know, your physical um, strength is important. Your position on the sled is important for aerodynamics. It's a very technical sport with the equipment. And it wasn't until the, the later part of my career that I started to really understand how my equipment works so that I could really customize it for myself. And I was relying on other people to, to do that, which works to some extent, but you, you know, you know yourself better than anyone. And especially as an athlete, as you evolve, you really know and come to trust yourself in that. So, so I wish I had asked more questions earlier on to understand all the, the parts that make a good leash athlete. Um, and then the second thing is I wish I had found more ways to bring my friends and family along on the journey. Um, you know, I was gone for five, six months a year, starting at age 13, um, traveling for this sport. And I think that I, if I had found more ways to sort of connect them to that experience, it would have been really powerful for them. So that's something I would change definitely is finding more ways to, to connect them to the sport and to my experience. And as you went through, you know, all of these, these ups, these downs, these successes, these things you wish you would have done differently, what do you think are some of the most important lessons you've learned that you think our audience would really benefit from hearing? Um, I think a couple. I think one is your value is intrinsic. Um, it's easy to get caught up in the results you're driving for or the promotions you're going after, or, but I think your value and worth is conditional, is not conditional. It exists because you exist. And, and I think that's a really hard thing, particularly as a woman to like ground yourself in. Um, I think the second thing is that time doesn't exist on its own like time you really have to shape time and shape it around your goals and really use it productively and then time becomes something you know a part of your memory is part of that um and then i think the last thing is is to take chances um like take chances on things you don't completely know or see yet there's no really way or equation or calculation you can make to know when to turn down something stable for an opportunity. And, you know, risk is an opportunity sometimes, but it's, it's a scary one. So, so if you have that thing that's pulling at your gut, um, you know, if, if you have those big goals that it's like, if I get that, your whole body just like comes alive, like go after those things. Cause, cause even if you come up short, short, the journey there is, is going to be amazing because you're living, sort of your own truth in what you want for yourself. Wow, great, wow. great lessons, great advice. You clearly, you know, you've talked about your connection to family, you've talked about your support system and asking for help. Along your journey, who have you found is, has really inspired you, be it, you know, a famous figure or your mom or you know <laughs> anybody around you who you really felt inspired by to to keep pushing yeah I mean definitely my parents it's cliche but again I was 11 years old and I, I don't know any parent um that grows up thinking I hope my kid does a sport like luge that is 90 miles an hour to dine this out of a mile in and they're going to be gone for six months a year um so you know my parents took a chance on me they believed in me before they even knew what they were getting into. And, and so they certainly have been role models for, for me for a long time and just grateful more than anything that they allowed me this opportunity as, as a young person. Um, I also, Jill Ellis is a huge role model of mine, um, the U.S. Women's, you know, coach. She has this great approach um, that, sh that she, she shares frequently is that you, you can't coach to keep your job. You have to coach to what you believe. And, and I just love that philosophy and watching how she took that team and, and, and 
continued to evolve them and change it so that they could stay on top and also allowed them to advocate for themselves off the field of play. Um, you know, now that's, that's become much more popular, but a couple years ago it wasn't. Mm -hmm. So she was really the first to make sure athletes knew that their voice mattered. Um, and then I think lastly, I, I have a nephew who's 11 and, and kids are like my recent inspiration. I think they're so resilient. Um, and their perceptions are not sort of mediated by the ex expectations and conventions of, of sort of been there, done that the way adults are. They approach everything as so new and an opportunity. And, and because I've had so much time with my nephew over these past couple months, um, really been inspired by his resiliency and, and his approach to, to living life. And it's great that you mentioned kids because that segues nicely into the next topic I wanted to chat with you about is once you kind of retired um, from your athlete life, um, I know you got involved um, with, you know, a summer camp. I know you work with athletes now. Can you tell us a little bit about that work you've done and kind of what motivated you to go in that direction? Yeah, I was very fortunate. I, I did some um, public speaking on behalf of an organization that wanted to ensure there was re responsibility around um, drinking and, and really trying to target high school students, making sure they're good, making good decisions for themselves. And through that, I also um, have always been really passionate about female empowerment and wanted to figure out the right way to connect with the next generation of girls in my community. Um, I, I had the idea of a conference and then someone um, came back with, what about a camp? And again, I'm a say yes person, figure it out later. Um, so I said yes and, and just was able to pull together the right people for a partnership, you know, through my local YMCA, through local companies that helped fund scholarships. Um, and, and really was able to, to sort of leverage my athletic experience to build the support system to support the program. And, and I just love it. I, I think um, something that keeps me up at night is the limited access to opportunity for kids, right? Well, particularly right now, but before now, you know, everything has um, become privatized or costly when we think of art, music, sports, there's not a lot of free programs left for kids. And, and that's concerning to me because I think as a young person, finding out who you are is important. And particularly if a young, if they're not getting that at home or getting the attention that's needed so that they can, can grow into a healthy person, you know, sport and art and music can provide some of that outlet. So um, it's something I'm, I remain passionate about is how do we expose kids to a lot of different things so that they can find the things that they love? Um, I think it leads to healthier young adults, um, you know, healthier communities. And it's really fun to see that sort of twinkle in the eye of a young person when they find their thing. Um, so I like to, be, like to try to partner with organizations that are committed to that. That's awesome. It sounds like you really found a, a great passion and you've really just ran with it. Yeah, I mean, so my, both my parents were teachers, my sister's a teacher, so I have a lot of, in my orb, a lot of people that give every day to, to kids, so I, I don't feel close to what they do, um, but, um, but try to do my part, try to inspire kids that, you know, I've, I was an 11-year-old girl from Augusta, Maine, um, that found something I loved and was willing to work hard at it, and there, there are, are, there's something out there for you if you're willing to work hard too. Um, so if, if, you know, one kid latches on to that and, and chases down their dream, that's exciting to me to give it back to the next generation. That's great. And I think that thought of, you know, there's something there for you if you're willing to work hard really also applies to all of us adults too, um, who might get a little discouraged when we don't see, you know, those instant results that we always kind of crave. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. It's hard. It's, it's particularly now with our social digital world, you're used to sort of instant response, instant gratification, instant validation. Um, but the important stuff, you know, the big goals, there's no way you can get instant gratification or instant validation on it. It takes time and consistency. 
um, and, and showing up every day to get a little bit better. And I know a lot of people have probably given you advice over the years, some that was helpful, some that was not so helpful. What's one piece of maybe conventional advice that you've heard before, you hear thrown around a lot, and you really just disagree with it? Yeah. Um, so for me, that one piece of advice is practice makes perfect. I think that is terrible advice. Um, I, I don't think practice doesn't make perfect. I think practice makes permanent. I think there's a misconception that um, by doing something repetitively, we automatically get better, but we don't get better by doing something over and over again. We get better by the feedback we get from doing something over again. And so learning how to be reactive to feedback is hard um, because it's your ego. It's, it's hard to take criticism, um, but, but that's really where the growth happens is being able to absorb feedback, react to it, and push yourself to try things a new way or, or do it differently based on that. And, you know, in sport particularly, but, um, you know, today's poor performance won't meet tomorrow's expectations. And so learning that was really important to me. And, and I used to cringe when my people would tell me practice makes sense. <laughs> I think that's great. I I know I personally struggle with perfectionism, and I'm sure yeah. it's something that a lot on this call can <laughs> relate to. And we're always kind of pushing for that, trying to get to the to the perfect goal. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So we do have. I know some people on the call um, who are probably going through some challenges, who are pushing through kind of that really tough spot and they just need a little, you know, boost of motivation, boost of inspiration to kind of kick them into gear. Um, you know, we're getting towards that holiday season and people are going to start, yeah. you know, getting really busy thinking about, you know, New Year's resolutions and all that stuff, I'm sure sooner than we even think. So what is a piece of advice you have for folks who are kind of right in the middle of that big challenge right now? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, if you feel in a rut, try to try something new outside of your comfort zone, whether it's a new group of people, a new activity. Um, it's a little bit harder now because of the restrictions we have in place. But even if it's, you know, if, if you always read fiction, read nonfiction or vice versa, right? Like just, just exposing yourself to, to something outside of the norm for yourself can get some thoughts um, sort of twirling. And then I think the other thing, like for me, I've always, um, like, if you feel helpless, tr trying to be helpful can help sometimes balance that. So, so if you're not sure where your next move is, sometimes helping other people, um, volunteering your time can help to sort of remind yourself of that, again, your, your value is intrinsic your important part of this community and, and it can help you to get sort of on a path towards reminding yourself of your worth and, and going after those goals. And we actually have a lot of audience questions pouring in. <laughs> so I'm going to jump over to those because I want to make sure we get all of them answered. Um, so I'm just going to go through these in the order that they came in. Thank you, everybody, so much for submitting these. Uh, feel free to submit some more if you have them on your mind. I'm hoping we can get through all of them. So the first question is really about, um, you know, you talked about asking for help and relying on your support system. You know, what were kind of, you know, that, that's a hard thing for a lot of people, I think, especially the, the folks who seem to be asking this question. Um, and we have a couple people who've asked about this. So kind of how do you do that? How do you take that first step in really reaching out and saying, I need help? Yeah, I mean, I think it really depends on what's the help you need, right? Like if, if you are feeling um, depressed, severe, you know, anxiety, things like that, medical professional 100%, right? Go and go to that. But if you are, you know, just feeling stuck in a rut, you know, struggling with the times, which are really hard, um, you know, be vulnerable and reach out and, and to someone and say, hey, haven't talked to you in a while, would really love to catch up, possible to grab coffee, you know, a virtual coffee or something. 
I think that emotional friction of even reaching out to someone that you haven't talked to in a while can feel like a huge barrier, barrier. but chances are they're having similar feelings or similar thoughts and just like don't want to make that first step. And I think that first step um, can be so hard, but, but once you make it and people, you'll find that people are so responsive, you know, friends that you haven't talked to in a while will feel grateful to hear from you and, and will want to connect and, and catch up on where you are. Um, I think some other, you know, ways to ask for help again are self-discovery. Um, I, I write in a journal, try to reflect on sort of where I am. Um, when I feeling like I'm, I'm not clear in my mind on what, what I'm trying to do, you know, that reflective process of putting pen to paper and, and starting to see where the gaps are can be helpful. Um, and, and once you sort of have a, a sort of clear vision of either what feels unbalanced in your life, then you can really make a plan on, on how you get the, the help or support or activity that you're needed, right? Like sometimes it's, oh, I haven't, I haven't exercised this week. I need to start exercising again um, because I know that it makes me feel better and I know that it feel, makes me feel more balanced during my day. Um, so just checking in with yourself can be really helpful. And I know you mentioned how you kind of asked for help a lot as you were going through kind of the challenges of your injuries and getting back to where you wanted to be in your career. But one of our questions is kind of how have you leaned into that in your non-athlete life and how has that benefited you once you were done in competitive sports? Yeah, I think, so I mentioned earlier that I wished I had you know, integrated my friends and family more into my journey. Um, so, so in my non-athlete life, I've tried to really try to make up for that and really try to strengthen relationships that were weekend because of my, my sport. Um, and so that, that's hard, right. To, to say, I wish I had talked to you more and I, you were really important and I didn't maybe treat you as important as you were supposed to. So I've been trying to to repair some of those close relationships that, that drifted because I didn't put the time and energy into them that they deserved. Um, and then I've also been playing catch up a little bit in the professional space because I entered, corp, you know, I entered work at age 30, which is, you know, different than a lot of other people. Um, so a lot of my um, asking for help has been trying to find mentors along the last sort of four years of my career. Um, making sure I sort of was making good decisions for myself, making sure that I was understanding the gaps that I have as a professional and, and how I could close some of those um, through my experiences in education. Um, so a lot of my asking for help has been in the professional capacity because I, I again, I, I entered my career at age, you know, my second career, so to speak, at age 30 and um, was playing catch up a little bit just to understand the nuances of work. And we're going to kind of throw it back a little bit with our, our next audience question to when you started competing um, and, and when you really got into the sport it sounds like it was kind of an instant love for you and, and even though you were young you know that's kind of a, a scary thing to tackle um, going out and and doing that um, how how did you feel kind of, of of being on your own and and how did your family react were they supportive kind of what was that dynamic yeah I mean they were definitely supportive again I this was you have to remember we didn't have cell phones, didn't really have internet, you know, from some, in when I was traveling, you know, I'd maybe be able to call home once a week. I had calling cards that I'd have to dial like, you know, 500 numbers to get back um, to my house. Um, so, so I would, I think that if my parents saw it in real time when I was 11, I, I don't know that I'd be here talking to you today, <laughs> but they weren't. Um, and by the time I was in it, you know, after a year and really was dedicated and said this, kind of thing, it was, you know, you can't, you can't turn back on that. Um, and I was a pretty passionate kid and more mature for my age in, um, before I started the sport. So they knew that when I made up my mind, I was pretty dead set on it. Um, and then as far as the sport, I, 
it's definitely not for everyone. Like I remember the tryout, there were some kids that were like, I'm done. Like, when can I get out of here? And there were those of us that just loved it. And I think um, we target younger, target's not the right word, but we recruit younger kids because it takes a while to rise the ranks. Um, one, you can't, you can't go right from the top. It takes a couple years to get up to the top of the track so that you have the, the size and strength to manage, to manage those high speeds. Um, and so that young age, it's, it's sort of the perfect to introduce for that reason too, because you're, if you're a fearless kid, you're a fearless kid um, and you're just going to fall in love with the sport. And our audience is, is really interested in kind of the logistics of, yeah. of luge and getting a little bit of background. So can you walk us through what, you know, from the getting ready to jumping on to going down kind of what is that process? Yeah, so we we start sitting on the sled. Um, so bobsled, they run and jump in, but in luge, you start sitting and you're holding two um, handles. And so the start is sort of a unique, you sort of compress your body and then pull out of the handles. And then we actually have spikes on our fingertips that we use to like, we call it paddling, but accelerate yourself down the ramp. Um, and then we settle into the, the sled. So we go from a seated position to that, that laying position. And then the first couple of seconds, you're just sort of getting adjusted. You might've missed your handle and you got to like sort of maneuver around to get into that comfortable spot on the sled. And then it, it really, um, time slows down because there's so much happening. You're really focused on your position on the sled, your it's a fine balance between oversteering and letting the sled run. So you really want to react to, to your run and not try to oversteer or over control. Um, so you're really paying attention to how do the ice conditions feel? You know, how high am I? How low am I? Um, and, and adjusting in the moment in real time, the whole way down um, and really paying attention to details. I used to, you know, I always would share that when I got off the sled after a run, I, you know, the run's 45 seconds long. I could talk for five minutes about everything that happened, you know, from start to finish, every little, you know, scrape of ice that I felt, everywhere I knew that my head was up too high. But then 30 minutes later, poof, gone. Like you, you lose those details because you're just so focused in the moment on what's happening. And then once you debrief it, you kind of go back to, okay, this is a new run and I'm not going to be, you know, I'm not going to allow all those thoughts to cloud my brain for the next run. But, but you're really focused on what's happening. Um, it, it's, it's hard to, uh, um, it's hard to describe the feeling. I, I've never found a great analogy or, or done something since. Skiing's close a little bit, but it's really hard to find something to compare it to and what it actually feels like to be on the sled. And this sounds so physically demanding. I mean, everything you just said, I'm thinking, wow. <laughs> how, how much do you have to practice to get ready for this? How many times do you have to do this before you are actually really ready to be competitive? Yeah, I mean, so you start younger, and you do a bunch of runs when you're a junior, you know, 10, 12 runs a day. Um, and then as you get older, your body really can't take that <laughs> um, the way it can when you're a kid. And so normally I would do five or six runs a day in the preseason. And then during the World Cups, you only get actually six training runs through the week and then the competition. So you're, you have limited runs. Um, we, it is, we, you know, we're going upwards of 90 miles an hour. You reach up to five Gs of pressure for like quick instances. So on TV, it usually looks pretty smooth and fluid um, when we're doing our jobs well. But in reality, there's a lot of force and pressure on your body. Um, a lot of, you know, strain on the neck to hold your neck in that position, your hip flexors um, to sort of hold your legs out in that straight position. So our off season um, was spent just conditioning, just recovering from the previous season for about a month um, and then starting to rebuild and get ready for the next season. And out of all of that, all of this sounds incredibly difficult to me, um, but we have an audience question uh, who wants to know what is the most difficult part if you had to pick one? It's, um, 
it's hard. So every track is different. They all have similar elements. So you have to have so many left hand, so many right hand, but you know, they vary in speeds. The slowest track is 65 miles an hour. The fastest track is 92 miles an hour. Um, and I would say every track has its own quirks to it, challenging parts. Um, and, and it also really depends on the individual athlete. So my least favorite track was a track in Germany, Allenburg, Germany. I can't say why it was so difficult. I just know that I never figured it out. And, um, you know, every year I went there, I was just happy to finish the race um, because I just never could find the rhythm on the track and, and, and get the steers right um, for whatever reason. But other, you know, teammates loved it and did very well there. So I wouldn't say it's the most difficult. Um, it's just every track sort of has its nuances and difficult parts to it. And you've mentioned that, you know, you can't really find an analogy to exactly describe what this feels like. So it's clearly very exhilarating. <laughs> I mean, this is, you know, you're going slowly 60 something miles an hour. Now that you're not doing that, do you miss that kind of adrenaline rush? I, I think sometimes I miss the focus um, because the goals were, were clear, usually, you know, particularly once I got to the World Cup level. Um, it was easy to, to set clear goals for myself. And I think in my, the professional world, it's harder. Your goals are relying on 100 other people in an office sometimes. So um, you don't have control over it the way you do as an athlete. I definitely miss the community. Um, my teammates we're super close. We text all the time. We, we, we chat and, and see each other occasionally, but it was a pretty, it's pretty special to, to, sh to have that team environment um, at that level. So I miss that. I definitely miss the people um, more than the sport, actually. Is there anything in your life right now that you feel like kind of comes close to that experience or it really is something that's just super unique and indescribable? Um, I don't know. It's really hard. I, it's pretty indescribable. I, it's, again, like when you're on the sled, you don't feel like you're going that fast because you're so focused on uh, trying to pay attention to how everything feels, um, that, that time slows down. When I watch it now, I'm like, holy shit, like, there it goes <laughs> a little bit. I get nervous for the, the athletes today. Um, but, but it's, 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 I really, I wouldn't say I'm as adventurous um, as you think, but I haven't found anything that, that's sort of comparable to it other than I have hobbies that I'm passionate about. So loving what you do certainly isn't something that I still experience. And from your time competing um, in, in the World Cup and the Olympics, do you have a favorite memory? Uh, yeah, I have a couple. Um, so, I mean, I just talked, so I won some World Cup medals at Lake Placid and my whole family and friends were there. Mm -hmm. And that was awesome. Um, you know, again, getting to share that moment with them. I... As far as the Olympics goes, um, one thing that was, you know, so cool about the Olympics is I knew all these athletes, skiers, freestyle skiers, we grew up together at the training center as kids, but we never saw each other compete because in the wintertime, our seasons are all over the place. So we only ever knew each other in the summertime when we were training at, at Park City or Lake Placid, New York, where the winter sports are sort of centralized in the U.S. So getting to see these amazing humans that I knew doing what they love for the first time was was really the highlight of my Olympics. Um, I love competing myself, but but I really enjoyed watching all the other sports um, at that highest level because I never had had the opportunity to do so. I knew so many people that competed, but never got to experience it. That's really cool. That isn't something that I thought of that you would never have the chance to kind of see these people that you're friends with and then you trained near uh, yeah do their thing that's, that's yeah. very cool so we have a couple more questions I think we can fit in before we have to wrap up 
So Julia, you know, what makes you laugh? What's one thing that you just absolutely love? Oh, I, I love like witty humor, um, like dry humor. I think some people call it British humor maybe, but <laughs> I love play on words. Dry humor really makes me laugh. Um, my nephew makes me laugh. He's, he's um, discovered TikTok and <laughs> I love to see him experience the world through that. It, it brings me a lot of joy um, and, and seeing his creativity come out. So I would say those, wit has been for a while, but the nephew on TikTok is new. I love that. I'm a big fan of TikTok myself, so I totally get where he's coming from. (laughs) I didn't know it. He introduced it to me, so I felt old, but (laughs) I uh, got it so I could follow him. And if you could give any piece of advice to young girls today, what piece of advice would you share? I I think, um, I like own it, own who you are, stand up for what you believe in, go after what you want. Um, you know, whether you do that or whether you try to, to meet other people's perceptions, someone's not going to like you anyway. So like own who you are, go all out, be proud of who you are and, and go after those dreams. Um, I hope that we, our generation can continue to to sort of break down ceilings so that it's the ground floor for the generation behind us. Um, I think we've seen significant movement, but there's more work to be done to really provide more opportunities for young girls, particularly in sport, but but other places as well. So that'd be my advice. Own it, own who you are, believe in yourself, go get it. That's great. I wish someone had told me that in my middle school years. I definitely could have used that piece of advice. Yeah. <laughs> So our last question for the night, what's next for you? What are some goals that you hope to accomplish and, and where you, do you want to be going? Yeah, so I, um, I, I actually work for the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee now. I lead our athlete development and engagement. Um, so my team is focused on creating academic, professional, and social opportunities um, so that, you know, the current generation of athletes have the time to be involved with new ideas, new people, new experiences, so that they can make sure they're building their identity outside of sport, that they're developing who they are as people along with who they are as athletes. Um, because, you know, we've seen that not all athletes transition well um, from sport, and we're really focused on trying to, to fix that so that the experience is positive not only while they're competing, but also as they move on um, from sport. And and for some sports, they figured it out a little bit better. Um, but but that's what I'm focused on. So I love that. I love that I get to stay involved in the movement. Um, I love that I get to try to try to work with athletes to identify who they are outside of sport, connect them with programs and resources um, so that they can further their education or get some work experience. Um, And then trying to, you know, I was in Colorado um, briefly and now back in Maine and gonna try to, you know, figure out what's next for my community work. Um, Feel a little disjointed, more disjointed than I have in the past with what's sort of happening in Maine and trying to reestablish some roots here after a year away. Well, best of luck. I know we're going to see some really great things from you, and I'm sure we'll probably be talking to you in another, you know, five to ten years about all the (laughs) the really awesome stuff that you've accomplished since this conversation. Perfect. Well, thanks so much. I really enjoyed being here, and, um, you know, feel free to find me on LinkedIn. I'm always looking to connect with local, like-minded, strong females, so. Yes, definitely. We will send out your LinkedIn um, when we send out our follow-up email. Um, And for those of you um, who didn't have to to hop off and are still on the call, we'd like to invite you to join us to our next um, We Are Me event. It's going to be on December 2nd. And we're going to be chatting with Eklis Ahmed, who is going to be sharing her story of fleeing the outbreak of civil war in Sudan with her mother, 
resettling in Portland and some of the work that she's been doing um, to help refugees in the Portland area. So we're very excited to have her on at our next one in December. Julia, thank you again so, so much um, for joining us. This was really a pleasure and I know we all got a lot out of it. You're welcome. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great night. Thank you.